Well, hello. Uh, my name is Pierre van der Westeisen, director of the Gilmore, and I am so thrilled to be joined today by our 2006 Gilmore artist, uh, Ingrid Fleeter. Uh, we were so happy to be able to add you to our virtual lineup for this season in this very special concert. So thank you, Ingrid, and welcome. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you very much. So glad I'm here and seeing you and talking to you. I know it's so wonderful. I'm so grateful for all of this technology that allows us to do these yeah, things. Absolutely. So, um, you know, a, a question that I have been wanting to ask you for a long time, and you know, Dan Gustin has, has told me a little bit about how special this award is and 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 the wonderful relationship that you've had with the Gilmore. But I'd like to hear from you. You know, can you tell us about that moment you found out about the award and, and just that whole experience? Well, yes, it's, it's historical for me <laughs> and hysterical at the same time. <laughs> yes, because I was it, that was absolutely the last thing I expected. I must tell you, it's the last thing I expected. So I was in Atlanta planning a, a recital for the Chopin Society. And I was not particularly happy about all oh, the weather or the circumstances, or I was far away from home again. And so, But I knew that someone from the Gilmore Award, which I knew afterwards, he was the director of the Gilmore <laughs> Festival, um, was coming to meet me and uh, my first thought my first impression was that he he was going to invite me to the festival which i was absolutely excited about so i even called my mom and i said you know that um, someone from the gilmore festival is coming and uh, we will see maybe i will be able to play in that wonderful festival that's so exciting okay so he came to my dress rehearsal which was in the morning and he invited me for lunch um, he was very friendly, very pleasant. Uh, actually, I felt so so easy going with him that I started talking about my life. He was asking questions, but very subtly in a subtle way. And <laughs> after maybe an hour of conversation and eating the salad, some salad in a very relaxed way, um, he says, "Well, you know that we have a festival in Kalamazoo," and I say, "Yes, yes, I know about that." So I said, oh, here comes the invitation. <laughs> and he says, well, and you know that we have the Gilmore Award. And yes, yes, I know about that. I know the, the other win the, the winners who are uh, Andrzejewski, I knew um, Ansnes. I say, okay, you're the next one. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> like that. Okay, you're um, the next okay. one. And I say, oh. what are you? talking about I, I was absolutely out of my my body i was oh. shaking i was shouting and uh, <laughs> i i hugged him without even thinking and uh, <laughs> it was one of the most touching and uh, revolutionary moments of my life you can imagine and then i called my mom i called uh, everyone and uh, dan could listen from the other side of the phone that everyone was shouting <laughs> <laughs> uncontrollably so That's yes wonderful. that really changed my life and actually mm, uh, what came afterwards came uh, changed completely my life yeah i was Open going to ask yeah. yeah i was going to ask what 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 has that allowed you to do you know what is the, that you wouldn't necessarily have done or thought about or you know anything that comes to mind that the, that the award has allowed for you well, it opened me the doors of the world yeah. uh, from many points of view. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually gave me wonderful management in the United States, uh, management in Europe, Asia, Australia, mm -hmm. um, a recording contract with EMI at that time, then Lean Records, um, concerts everywhere in the world I could have. I, I had the privilege to start saying no to something, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is quite uh, rare when yeah. you're a student and when, when you're growing and when you are struggling like so many young people are doing. So to start thinking that some things I, I could have a choice that was really unique.
And for most of all, was that the recognition, the, the support, the trust that I received from such a distinguished uh, jury that was really a very revealing and very important moment for me because I felt not alone anymore I, and I felt um, embraced by a huge arm uh, of, of group of people who really gave me a lot of trust and enthusiasm to go on with my music making. Well, it's something that really struck me uh, when I came to the Gilmore is that there's this beautiful relationship between uh, the audiences here, um, not only the organization, but the audiences and the Gilmore artists, and particularly uh, you. Um, they, I, you know, people in this stop me in the street and ask me, so when is Ingrid coming again? She's coming again, <laughs> yes. And, um, there's this beautiful thing that has developed, you know, this love story between uh, That's you I and, and to the ask. audiences. Yeah, absolutely. You read my mind because that that was the, the on top of everything that I said. I found an amazing group of people that yeah. became many of them became dear friends with me, yeah. and we are in touch even if we don't see each other for for long time and um, every time I come to Kalamazoo it feels like home no, and but... I feel the warmth of the people I feel the enthusiasm and yeah. uh, it's really like a shot of energy for me of life yeah. of love for music love for art in general so what, what a wonderful society that really understands and, and uh, feels the importance of this right. experience of the artistic experience so it's really unique right and we know I mean as a musician myself, and, and we know as artists that that kind of atmosphere spills out onto the stage, right? And it, it just inspires oh, wow. you as an artist. Oh, and, then, and and and, and no I, I think that's and actually the, the, the public is quite open to new experiences. It's not the kind of public that they heard the recording and they want exactly what they know. They are open to new things, to yeah. uh, new, uh, you know, go over the boundaries and uh, experience, and they are fresh and experience the music for itself and not for a prejudice or something that they are expecting you to do. They are quite, um, quite unique also from, yeah. from that point of view yeah yeah it, it makes for some really wonderful opportunities for unique programming and um you know like you said pushing the boundaries uh but you know i'm so curious how did this uh program come about this recording that you you made i understand it was uh in collaboration with the festival but i'm, I'm curious how this all came about how you found a studio all of that can you can you tell me how this how this <laughs> happened <laughs> Well, first of all, it was in the middle of the lockdown, so everything yeah. was impossible to do. But I decided to pick up the phone and contact my, my friend who made a video. He was, mm -hmm. of course, free and available. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody had nothing to do. Uh, yeah. The place that I rented, it was a beautiful place uh, in um, here where I live, in the mountains, in the lake, mm. um, which they use for for events, but they never use it. It's most of the year it's free, mm -hmm. uh, empty with only the beautiful wood. But um, so I knew this place because I lived in, in nearby that, and I had my piano inside at that time. Of course, it was not there anymore. So I could prepare also the Beethoven recording that I did 10 years ago. I, rec wow. I prepared in this place and I it has beautiful windows looking uh, to the mountains and it, at that time it was January so it was winter and snowing so I have the best memories of that place and so wow. an another good reason to, to go there. It was available of course. Then um, my fr friend who has a piano shop in Italy where they were closed but they had the chance to open just uh, the deposit of the piano, just for me. <laughs> so they brought me the piano from Milan. Everything was arranged in three days. Three. Wow, wow. And, and I only had to get ready and practice because, um, <laughs> you know, when we were in that time of the year, it was April, or everything looked so far away that uh, we were all in our no uh, cage, cage, mm -hmm. no caves, our caves. Yes. And right. 
so to imagine that I was going to record something, it felt so enormous. But then I said, why? This is something I know how to do, and I've been doing all my life. Yeah. The little, little details that I had a, a daughter that was two months old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but <laughs> talk about that. But in any case, uh, I organized it in three days, and actually, those things sometimes that come out in a in a very natural and spontaneous way are the ones who come out in the best way. Mm-hmm. In my experience, yeah. always happens that the things that uh, you know just you do with your guts and uh, with your belief yeah. that it. And you go with it and you go with the flow they work very well and actually it was i play the recording absolutely from the beginning to end and then wow. uh, you will you won't see that but then i, I jump in the floor i say oh how wonderful it is to play but you <laughs> i wish we had that, that. The <laughs> <laughs> you know should, should, should have cut but um oh, i was so lovely. happy to do it so happy yeah. to do it and um, also I included a repertoire that I deeply loved in all mm-hmm. my life so I played uh, Be- two composers which are my dear dear friends uh, Beethoven and Chopin and uh, Beethoven uh, Sonata Opus 31 number three which is really a unique work that I love love very much because mm-hmm. uh, Beethoven shows in this work a different perspective and a different phase from what we are used to. We are used to see Beethoven with the eyebrows quite angry and, right. uh, you know, the this fighting uh, concept of uh, energy. But in this music, he mm, shows us uh, wit, humor, um, even lightness uh, and he, what what's mo- most curious is that he composed this music in one of the darkest periods of his life mm-hmm. and besides that he was able to create such a you know celebration of life yeah. and this is something that really inspires all of us enormously so i think that this sonata really it's very proper for this time of the, the it is, time you know, that we are living how wonderful yeah i was talking to um another Gilmore artist, uh, Igor Levitt, the other day about Beethoven. And he's, you know, he made a point also that even in all of this, the darkest moments with, with Beethoven, um, you know, it kind of, he comes through this, there's moments of hope and which is so, yes. which is so important. And, and especially now, especially this year. And so I'm thrilled yes. that you, that you presented Beethoven because it does, it gives us that, that just that moments to hold on to. Absolutely, I agree. I yeah. agree. And also the, the second part of the recital is dedicated to Chopin, which is uh, the quintessential of enjoyment when you listen to piano music, I must say. Yeah. Well, I mean, Chopin and you, I, for me, I feel like, you know, almost synonym. When I think of Chopin, I think of Ingrid. Um, and especially oh, you. when, you know, when I came in 2018 and you did this beautiful uh, dedication recital to Dan Gustin of, of, of Chopin Nocturnes. Um, what is it about Chopin that is so that you connect with so deeply? Well, first of all, I owe my life to him, actually, because mm-hmm. um, my parents met thanks to my father playing the Chopin waltz in the piano. Oh, no kidding. They were. Yes, oh, so it was a... Neighborhood meeting, and my father had a piano at home, and my mother was invited to this meeting, and she heard my father playing by ear. He was not a professional pianist; he he just played by ear, and I still remember him playing when I was a little child. Chopin mm. waltz is in really a wonderful way. So she fell she fell in love. They both fell in love, and that's the how I I was born. <laughs> let's say. <laughs> uh, then my grandmother was from Poland, so uh-huh. I always heard stories of Polish gentlemen. Yes. Then Rubinstein recordings sounding at home everywhere, mm. in the car, in the kitchen. <laughs> uh, in the morning, the evening, all the time I had the Rubinstein recordings in my in my uh, everyday life. Like yeah. bread, I had Chopin and Rubinstein. <laughs> and... And when I first started playing the piano, when I was nine, nine and a half, my teachers had the very good idea to give me right away Chopin, 
why mm. I say grandiose because I do believe that it's one of the, the composers that really enhances your possibilities um, as a pianist as much as possible because you have to develop the sound, the singing tone, the imagination, the beauty, etc. So many things. So I, I think it's quite important to develop also the natural relationship with the with the keyboard. Yeah. And and when I was at that really young, like 11 or 12, I, I could only under, you know, have the intuition of the beauty that I was facing by playing Chopin. It's only afterwards that you discover the darker side, the, the richness, the depths of this music, which is not something that everyone knows because you just right. think about Chopin like an entertainment composer, salon composer, but it's nothing far, more far away from the truth. Right. Um, so he became my companion of life afterwards, yeah. little by little, and I, I owe him maybe one of the some of the most uh, happy moments of my life. Well, and I... uh, he believe he, he really talks one to one, so it's a dialogue that he establishes with the listeners. Not he doesn't talk to the big mass. He doesn't talk. Um, he doesn't want to give a message that it's valid for everyone. It's, it's the best friend who tells you his deepest secret. And you That's feel wonderful. just, you know, privileged to, to be able to share this human experience with him because yeah. it's nothing more than that. He doesn't tell stories or uh, like literature stories. He doesn't uh, paint uh, landscapes. He just talks heart to heart and um, in a very very simple way you know also yeah. but that's and... so perfect how you say that because that's kind of how how i feel when when listening to you play chopin it's it's almost like eavesdropping on this conversation and uh, it feels very intimate it feels very very touching and so i i'm thrilled that you included chopin on this recording thank you, thank um, you. i'm so glad you say this it's oh, very very really much i think everybody's going to to love it. I have one one last question. Um, I know you live in Italy now. How long have you lived in Italy? And um, I know, you know, it's a, this, so it's two questions, I guess, you know, how long have you lived in Italy? And how how is life with how all this Alma, you have a new baby girl? And how is life with with her? And, and how's everything going? Well, uh, in Italy, I live for more than half of my life so it's uh -huh. 25 years already wow. and i'm 47 <laughs> so <laughs> amazingly most of half of my life yeah. and you know even if you live here all your life and you will never be a real italian <laughs> i must say <laughs> you will never be because that's something that you have in your blood yeah, and you can imitate them. You can love them. You can feel like you're, you know, using your hands in the way they do, yeah. uh, eating <laughs> in the way they do. But you will never be Italian, uh, <laughs> even though I come from a culture that is quite near and quite similar. Because right. in Argentina, we have mostly Italian um, influences and culture, uh, and Spanish as well, of course. In any case, Italy gave me so much, it gave me education, gave me a husband, gave me my daughter. And, uh, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm very much uh, in love with this country, with all the difficulties that, you know, we all know. Uh, yeah. But still, it's a country that f evaluates uh, friendship, mm -hmm. um, enjoyment of life, a sense of, you know, just uh, cheering up, even right. if life, you know, it's sometimes difficult to deal with. Right. Um, so that's something that I try to imitate. I, I'm sometimes I succeed, sometimes not, of course, <laughs> like all of us. But um, and I almost, now I have an Italian daughter, which is yeah. quite amazing for me. I don't have Italian passport, but she does now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's. Uh, one of the biggest miracles of my life, the presence of this little girl, Alma. She's an amazing miracle. I see, I look at her and I'm still asking myself, what's the role 
uh, that I have in her life. What, what's the meaning of being a mother? It's not so easy to understand. I, it's, I think it's something that it grows with you. And I believe I have to accompany her in her life because that's yeah. her life. So I, yeah. I, I have to be a presence that helps her uh, find out who she is. And it's quite a privilege. Well, you know, I had a wonderful friend who said, um, with the first birth of our first child, uh, who said, when the child is born, the mother is born, the father is born. So we all learn together. And I think it's actually a quote from somebody else, but I, I can't remember, but I, that has stayed with me all this time and we all learn together. But uh, Great way to put it, Pierre. Exactly. Thank you. I will, Absolutely. It will accompany me as well. Very good way of saying it. <laughs> Well, Ingrid, thank you so much for taking some time to talk with us, to talk with me. And uh, we can't wait to hear you and uh, hope to have you uh, here in Kalamazoo again someday. But uh, in the meantime, all the best to you and your beautiful family. Thank you, Pierre. The same for you. What a pleasure to talk to you thank on this you. occasion. Thank you.